Good evening, Massachusetts. Good evening, Massachusetts. Make some noise if you're here for a poor people's campaign. Make some noise if you're here from not Massachusetts. Yeah, that's right. We have folks from Maine and from Vermont and New Hampshire and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York and Rhode Island and Connecticut. Make some noise if you're here from somewhere in Massachusetts. Make some noise if you're from right here in Greenfield. Awesome. My name is Clinton Wright. I'm on the national field team with the Poor People's Campaign, and it is my pleasure to introduce you tonight to two women that need no introduction, um, who are the chairs of the Massachusetts Poor People's Campaign, Miss Savina Martin and Miss Kirsten Levitt. Let's give them a round of applause. a national call for moral revival. And welcome to the 11th stop of the National Do More Tour. Hey, give yourselves a round of applause. We know we got more to do. We got more mobilizing. We got more organizing. We got more registering and educating to do. So that's why we are here today. And I thank all of you beautiful people for staying in the trenches and keeping your ears to the grind because somebody's hurting our brother and we are not taking it anymore. Again, my name is Sabina Martin and I've been in the movement quite a long time coming out of the Homeless Union. And uh, here I am, um, taking it to another level with Kristen Levitt. I'm the Massachusetts chair of the eastern side of the state, the greater Boston area, Somerville, Cambridge, and everything around it. So let me turn it over to my sister, Kristen. <laughs> and we are strong in Franklin County. We are young and we are strong in Franklin County. We have only been together as a group reformed for the last six months. And in the last six months, we went from 12 members to over 80. We are organizing. We are mobilizing. We are organizing. We are gonna register you and we're gonna educate you. We are gonna help poor people make informed decisions right here in our municipality, in our, in our counties, and in our state. I can't say how much it means to me to have Dr. Martin introduce me as her sister. Amazing that she became my sister in the cause in just the last few months. And because she came here and heard your stories, she said, to Dr. Barber and to Dr. Theo Harris, you need to come here. So get ready to be inspired tonight. Get ready to hear testimony tonight. Get ready to learn what you can do more right here tonight. Let me tell you that this is a phone and camera friendly event. Get out your phones, take pictures, post on social media, go ahead. We want people to know we're making some noise in Franklin County tonight. We want people to know the Poor People's Campaign is here. We want people to know that they can mobilize, organize, register, and educate every single person in this country to have power. We have power. Let me tell you that if you have small children here tonight, we have child care for you. So if you need your children to come out, we have Guess what? Poor People's Campaign coloring pages and watercolors and a whole slew of things for children to do right over here. So if your children need to go out, you can bring them right over to Crystal. 
Okay, so I want to let you know about that. And now I would like to welcome our regional coordinator and part of the national coordinating team, Clinton Wright, back to tell you more. I lied. This is what happens when I get too excited. First of all, let's thank Ms. Joan Watman for doing our American Sign Language interpretation. And I invite Catherine Golub to talk to you about Spanish language tra uh, translation right now. Hola, buenas tardes. Hay traducción en, para, espan, para la gente que habla en español. Si pueden levantar su mano si necesitan traducción. Tenemos máquinas y estamos dispuestos para que entiendan todo lo que, todo el evento. Entonces, si pueden levantar su mano. También, en, si están en el otro cuarto, hay gente ahí con máquinas. Parece que no hay nadie. <laughs> ok. Thank you. How you all feeling out there? We're going to keep the energy going in the house, right? We're going to keep it going. Right now, I just want to acknowledge and, and do some thank yous especially to our partners, our allies, and our friends that are in the room who have been the driving force of this movement since we launched in Massachusetts in 2017. I mean, when we first started, we had meetings of 44 folks, and next week it grew to 100, and next week 200. We were expanding as we went along. And this movement is about ebbs and flows, and we went through our ebbs and flows, but we are here tonight! We are here tonight. And right now, I just want to acknowledge some, uh, just a couple of people, because I know we're on a time frame that's here in the house. I want to thank Sheila North. You stand up. She's here from Canada. She's a member of the Boone and Bobby Cree Nation, formerly known as the Oxford House. Sheila North was the Grand Chief of the Manitoba Kiwatani. Uh, MKO from 2015 to 2018. And Sheila is recognized for her efforts in building bridges between indigenous and non-indigenous communities during her time in media and most recently at MKO. She has met, led many initiatives and she is working with murdered, uh, with, with, with murdered indigenous women. She will be in Boston, Massachusetts tomorrow at Jama in Jamaica Plain, and she will be showing her film. I hope I got that right because that was so quick. Give her a hand. I want to thank our partners in Massachusetts. One of the first to endorse us is Mass Peace Action. Jonathan King, raise your hand, he's here. Cole and Brian. I want to thank our endorsers. SEIU 1199 is in the house. And our folks with the Homeless Union. Kristen Colangelo from New Jersey and Jay from New Jersey. We've got Rhode Island in the house. I mean, and everybody in between that are in the trenches. So without further ado, and if I forget anyone, we'll say it as we go along. Just give me those little snaps. Um, we're going to talk about our land acknowledgement. And we want to bring her up right now. And I want you to introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here. This land here is Pakumtuk homeland. And the statement we're going to read was written with Abenaki First Nations people and the Nolambika Project. We want to acknowledge that we are standing on and benefiting from land that was seized, expropriated, and stolen from indigenous people. For thousands of years, this has been Pakumtuk land. This is still the homeland of Pakumtuk, Narwadic, Waranoko, Aguam, Nutmilk, and also Sokoki, Abenaki, so that the leadership of indigenous people today is strong. These native peoples and their descendants are still living here among us 
Every time we gather here, we must acknowledge and respect that fact. So as a step towards ending erasure of indigenous people, let's hear two names of indigenous people of Pakumtuk leaders here, 1600s. First, Sankumaku, Sachem, Pakumtuk Sachem, who died at Great Falls, May 19th, 1676, along with 300 in the massacre. We, we also picture Mashalisk. She was the Sun Squaw, the woman leader, in the place that's now the Quaker Center in North Deerfield. But she was working with power with a thousand people. Mashalisk is here today. Humbly, we encourage you to get to know indigenous people in your area and ask what you can do to lift and raise their voices, honor and respect their sovereignty. In that spirit, I have three action items. One is to recognize and make changes to the dominant narrative that glorifies colonization and genocide of indigenous peoples. Be mindful, for example, that the term pioneer valley is problematic. Uh, consider contributing to funds such as the Nipmuc Cultural Preservation Fund. And finally, support the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda. Six bills to support causes that are important to the Native people, including changing the state flag and seal. It's so fitting that we're meeting right here because five miles from here at Great Falls, that's where for thousands of years it was a peace village. People came together, share salmon, build unity. And so today we come together in common cause. Without further ado, Kate Stevens, the Reverend Kate Stevens. Let me say first, this is the welcome. I just want to say you all look fantastic. You really, it's so fantastic. So good going, Greenfield, good going, Kirsten, and all the organizers here, this is beautiful. And I just want you to know there's another hundred some people in the other room watching us on a screen. My name is Kate Stevens, and on behalf of the interfaith community of Franklin County, I want to welcome you here to Second Congregational Church in Greenfield. But not only do I welcome you to Greenfield, I welcome you to Western Mass. There are some around the world who think that Massachusetts is Boston. And when you say West, Western Mass, they think you're saying Weston, comma, Mass. No, Western Massachusetts. But we are all here tonight. That's the sense that I've gotten, including some from Boston. So I want to introduce you to the whole of the state of Massachusetts. Springfield, Holyoke, Northampton, Amherst, Worcester, North Adams, and of course our friends from Vermont and Connecticut and Rhode Island. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to those of you in the other room. I just want to say a couple logistics. Uh, I want to tell you about exits, should we need them. You can go, all go out, there's several doors out this way, the same way we came in, and then there's an accessible ex, um, exit when you go into the hall and take a left, or if you go right, there's another exit, but that involves uh, five or six steps. So we just think it's important that people know where to go if you need to get out. Um, and secondly, about bathrooms. There is an accessible bathroom through this door and just around to the left, or the end of the fellowship hall down the stairs. There's two bathrooms down there also. So in this politically loaded week, <laughs> we need to remember in the words of Dr. King, we are a new unsettling force. <laughs> and we are powerful. 
This country of ours, this land we live on and the creatures that inhabit it are so precious, we cannot give up on the struggle. So let our voices be heard here in Massachusetts and all over New England and actually all throughout the whole country. So welcome friends to the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral, and we mean moral, revival. Theo Musicology. We're gonna start this by giving some respect to Martin Luther King and the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. This song came out of that moment. It was written by Reverend Frederick Douglass Kirkpatrick and Jimmy Collier. It's been updated in the new Poor People's Campaign a little bit. It's got a chant part and it's got a singing part. We're gonna start with the chant part. So I'm gonna say, everybody's got a right to live. And you're gonna say, to live, ready? Everybody's got a right to live, to live. Everybody's got a right to love, to love. Everybody's got a right to dream, to dream. Everybody's got a right to learn, to learn. Everybody's got a right to live, to live.
called Mi Unica Bandera, my only flag. The Spanish part says, listen my people, we bring strength. Freedom is my only flag, and you'll get the English part. The role of music during protest. This, this last song is by Aaron Fowler. Oh, one more. Rises One. And we are going to be rising together for June 20th in Washington, D.C.
will rise as one. I want to introduce next one of the most powerful women and dear friend and sister in the struggle that I've known, Dr. Reverend Liz Theo Harris. Let's receive her. Good evening, Greenfield. Good evening, Massachusetts. Good evening, the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. You all indeed look absolutely beautiful. And I look forward to seeing everybody here and a hundred of your closest friends in June 20, 2020 at the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington. We are very excited about this mass meeting in the spirit, in the history of mass meetings throughout history. And I have one little announcement to make, which is that the folks that are here, the testifiers that will be sharing with us this evening, the songs that we'll be singing together are the real reason we're gathered. They are the folks who are this indeed new and unsettling force. We are on a very long tour doing 25 states. As Savina said, I don't even know which state this is, but what, what is it? <laughs> Somewhere between 11 and 14. And we are in the state of Massachusetts, that I do know. <laughs> and the doctor has just called Reverend Barber to be off the road for a couple of stops. So he sends his greetings. We will hear from him on the video this evening, but he is not able to be here with us in Greenfield, Massachusetts. But that is why you and a hundred of your closest friends will be with us on June 20th, 2020 in Washington, DC. And this is just the beginning. So I want us to now see a little bit of, of the, the folks across the country who are organizing. We have a short video, then a message from Reverend Barber, and then the real reason we're here, which is to hear from the testifiers from across Massachusetts. I'll, I'll give some words, we'll have some uh, a call to action, and we'll get ourselves even more ready to, to roll up our sleeves and do the work of mobilizing, of organizing, of registering, of educating people for a movement that votes. So uh, please watch this video and the following one and um, get in the spirit of, of what mass meetings, what organizing is all about, and why we actually need for our truest selves and the saving the soul of our heart of democracy and this nation why we need this poor people's campaign our democracy is in trouble, our democracy is in trouble. And, we and we come to demand second warning because it's crucial that we make ourselves heard we are the poor people's campaign a national call for moral revival. And we are here. We are poor. We are clergy. And we're here to say to our nation's capital and to the highest court in this land that everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to learn. Everybody has a right to love. Everybody has a right to live in wages. Everybody has a right to vote. Everybody has a right to thrive, to thrive in the society. Everybody say, oh! I believe that we will win. I believe that we will win. We read Article 6 of the Kentucky State Constitution that says we have a right to free assembly. We are demanding that we stop the war on our poor. There are 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, almost half of this nation. And any nation that ignores half of its people is in a moral economic crisis. So we will so we do, will. More. do more. There will be a movement that will break through the pond and bring people together to save the heart and
and the soul of this democracy and this world. We have listened to the political consultants enough. They say don't talk about poverty. They say we don't, don't say we don't, we don't have the money. They say somebody accused you of socialism. Well, according to some folks' definition of socialism, Jesus was a socialist. So you don't worry about being accused, that's tell the truth. So what do we have for 50 years? Republicans have racialized poverty. Democrats have run from poverty or come up with synonyms like uh, those working to get in the middle class. No, some people are poor and low wealth. And look at where that has gotten us. Look at where that strategy has gotten us. 150 years after the 15th Amendment, millions of black folks and poor whites and others have walked away from the ballot box because they don't believe going will make a difference. A hundred million of them just sit out and many of them make up the 140 million poor and low wealth people because they and other poor Americans rarely hear a politician call their name or call their condition. And any nation that doesn't address poverty is in moral crisis and we can't address it without taking on the interlocking injustices of systemic racism, ecological devastation, militarism, the war economy, and a distorted religious narrative and white evangelicalism that says the only thing God is concerned about is praying to school, being against gay people, being against a woman's right to choose guns and voting Republican. That is a heresy. Not just a lie, it's a heresy. We must start with the real numbers. There are not 39 million poor people in America. There are 140 million poor and low wealth people in America. 60% of black people, 26 million. 66 million white people, 30% are poor and low wealth. 62 million people make less than a living wage. And we have allowed 30 presidential camp debates to go on and not one on poverty and low wealth or on systemic racism. So we're about to move into the most important part of the evening, where we get to hear from those who are standing up, telling their stories, talking about their truths, but also rising with solutions. This Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, puts out that we need to get this country to be brought to our knees, to cry, to mourn for the suffering that is taking place, and then rise up together to demand the justice, to demand the righteousness that we all need and deserve. So to get us into the spirit of hearing from the testifiers, we're going to have one more piece of movement culture or theomusicology. And, and we want to uh, engage in this song and then ready ourselves to hear from some of the voices, some of the real heroes and heroines of this nation, of Massachusetts, of this world, who are helping us lead ourselves into justice. So we'll have uh, another a word of song and then some more words of truth. Thank you, Reverend Leo Harris. Uh, Theo Harris, excuse me. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Yara Allen, Dr. Yara Allen, who's yes. one of the lead theomusicologists of this movement. Uh, I would say the Poor People's Campaign has really set itself apart as being a particularly musical movement. And I have been so amazed and impressed at how the leadership of this movement has prioritized music as an integral part of the struggle. My name is Ben Grosskup. I live here in Greenfield. And I, uh, I, wrote, I wrote a song called No More Sacrifice Zones. Uh, this is a song that was inspired by a book by the journalist Chris Hedges, uh, which is called Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Uh, and, and when we think about poverty and how it is so uh, geographically 
centered in certain places, particularly in its, its extreme for, forms. We, we see that these are places in our society that have been sacrificed systematically to a logic of never-ending profit accumulation. So I've asked uh, Leah Snape to accompany me on piano, and I ask all of you to sing along with me on the uh, sing-along parts. So oh. 
So both myself and Reverend Barber are pastors, and we find the part in the Bible that says, even if these stones, even if these were, were quiet, the st very stones would cry out. I'm going to try that again. Even if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The stories we're preparing ourselves to hear are the people and the stones crying out in injustice, demanding justice. We have a way of, of honoring and welcoming our testifiers, which is that when folks have said their piece, instead of applauding, we ask you to follow in saying somebody has been hurting our people and it's gone on far too long and we won't be silent anymore. And we do this because when we were in one of these mass meetings in Alabama, a leader was sharing his story and folks started to applaud him and he said, please, don't applaud, but link arms with me and commit to fighting for justice. And in honor of him and the folks that are willing to come forward telling their stories, we now say somebody is hurting our people. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. So I'm going to invite the four testifiers we have this evening to come up together. We have a saying in our work that we stand together because we stand together. And, and so, folks, we never have people alone. Um, and we, we know that we're here together, um, standing together for justice. So I want to invite Joanna Whitney, who is going to speak about SS policies, Maria Colville, who is going to speak about being a low-wage healthcare worker, Sarah Ahern, who's going to talk about opiate recovery and poverty, and James Shearer, who's going to speak about homelessness, to all come up together um, and, and, and share their, their words of truth with us this evening. And after each person speaks, we will say together, somebody is hurting our people, and it's gone on far too long, and we won't be silent anymore. So please welcome our heroes and heroines. It's totally appropriate to clap now. Completely appropriate, in fact, really required. My name is Joanna Whitney. I live here in Greenfield. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. If you could help improve the lives of eight million poor people, would you? We can. It would be both simple and difficult. Simple because all that's needed is for the federal government to allow people who receive 
Supplemental Security Insurance, or SSI, to save more of their own money. These are people living with disability, people who are blind, and people who are seniors and also poor. Difficult, because this would require the government to treat poor people as if we were honest, as wow. if we matter. Wow. Let me explain. SSI is a cousin to, but not the same as Social Security Disability Insurance and Social Security Retirement Benefits, both of which are earned by working and paying into the system. SSI recipients may have never been able to work or could not work enough to earn SSDI eligibility or they had a job that didn't pay into Social Security. Someone like me who worked in the public sector. The average SSI payment is $536 a month. The maximum is $771. Not much to live on. To receive SSI, you cannot have more than $2,000 in the bank on the day you receive your SSI check, including that month's payment. If you are even a few dollars over, they claw back the entire month's check. They call this guarding against fraud and abuse. That $2,000 resource limit has not changed since 1989. Think about how much more expensive everything is now. The general cost of living and also disability specific needs like building a ramp, modifying a bathroom to make it safer, or getting a service dog all have gone up in 30 years. As a consequence, people on SSI struggle and often fail to afford those things. About 3,000 people in Franklin County are trying to live on SSI, over 8 million across the United States. Some face lifelong challenges because they were born with a disability or live in a toxic environment as children. <clears throat> Others acquire a serious injury or disabling illness as adults. And there are seniors who face the growing limitations of age while trying to live within the constraints of poverty. The effect of the $2,000 resource limit and penalties for going over that limit treat a vulnerable group of people as if we would rather cheat the system than work. We are not the problem. The real problem is that the government has neglected SSI and the people on it. The solution is both simple and difficult. It is simple to allow people to save their money if they can. And it is difficult to build the political will to see these people also have lives of inherent value. I hope you will join the march in Washington on June 20th. As always, justice demands that we show up for it. Thanks.
Good evening, Movement family. Good evening, Movement family. My name is Maria Carville, a native of Trinidad and Tobago, who have been living in Massachusetts, living and working in Massachusetts for over 30 years in the medical field as a CNA, a PCA, a companion. I'm also a union employed worker with 1199 SEIU. My fight around wages and health care began when I joined the union, but it was intensified after attending the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival in Washington, D.C. in 2019. What an eye-opener. Two things happened to me. First, I understood the true meaning of the scripture in John 8, 32, which says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yes. And secondly, my mindset was changed from making a living to making a difference. Yes. I had been exposed to a forum of truth, and I finally understood, while the only evidence I had to show after 30 years of hard work was tiredness, poor health, and deep despair. I was afraid to dream or set a goal for myself or my family, because my life experience said it was unattainable. My life experience said, no, because my life experience didn't matter. It didn't matter how hard I worked. My income could only pay bills. And sometimes I had to borrow to make ends meet. Getting sick was a luxury I could not afford, but it showed up anyway. And I saw myself financially financially plummeting into helplessness and hopelessness until that life-changing forum of truth in Washington, D.C. I finally found out why my life seemed to be in a downward spiral. There are systems in place to ensure that I don't succeed. You can't achieve your goals or dreams when you are working for a wage that does not even allow you to meet your basic needs. It is not a livable wage. I thought my issues was just that, mine. I found out I was not alone. Millions of people have the same problems that I was experiencing. We are all hostages of poverty, primarily because we lack the knowledge of truth. We are so busy trying to make a living that we do not realize that our life is just one piece of a big puzzle called humanity. Humanity is not whole without us. There is power in our brokenness. When we unify, we are the solution to every problem that we face. We have to start seeing each other as a reflection of ourselves. There is only one race, the human race. What is good for one should be good for all. A true leader is one who seeks the common interest of all. Every decision made based on our differences is the wrong decision. I left the Poor People's Campaign in Washington having gained knowledge, understanding, and understanding of our reality. And I am being equipped in ways to apply appropriate solutions. We need you in, our, in your brokenness to unify mobilize, come together, because then we are stronger than the forces against us. Broken, busted, and disgusted, 
in one voice, speaking truth to power. One is the most powerful number there is because nothing begins without it and nothing ends without it. There is no whole without you. I found my voice when I joined a cause bigger than myself. That cause is you. June 20th, 2020 is our next opportunity to speak truth to the powers that be in Washington, D.C. Make the choice to be empowered and to equip yourself. Be there. Good evening, my brothers and sisters. My name is Sarah Ahern. I am a poor person from Greenfield, Massachusetts, and most recently, rural West County. I am also a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder and trauma. How poverty has intersected with my recovery will be the focus of my testimony this evening. Recent national data, data shows that stigma still is the biggest barrier for someone like me to ask for help, find sustained recovery, and share our stories openly. Why? Because stigma is just a fancy word for discrimination. Stigma has manifested itself in my life many times, excluding me from vital resources such as housing because I am unhousable, excluding me from seeking gainful employment because I am unemployable and untrustworthy. And because I am a poor person in long-term recovery, stigma doesn't care if I have two days or 30 years. But the most serious impact stigma has had on me personally is excluding me from access to vital life-saving health care. Two years ago, I suffered an unfortunate accident that I now know caused multiple spinal injuries and a traumatic brain injury and negatively impacted my mental health. From my initial interaction with the medical system, I was disbelieved, devalued, and passed from provider to provider, labeled a drug seeker. Despite the fact of having almost five years in long-term recovery and never asking for an opioid pain medication. I did not receive any images of my brain or spine until 11 months after injury, despite experiencing extreme pain and classic symptoms of a concussion in a traumatic brain injury. As I moved through each mountain of discrimination and denial, even more were yet to be presented to me. I was not referred to appropriate specialists further delaying my care, and to add insult to injury, my insurance company, the People's Insurance, dropped my coverage three times in the first year and a half for no appreciable reason. This also denied me access to PT1 rides to specialists to further evaluate my brain and spinal injuries. It also prevented me from accessing behavioral care services and caused long-lasting damage to my brain and body. It is during this time I became hopeless and helpless. And because suicidality is a common side effect of a traumatic brain injury, I nearly lost my life. I know that my recovery from substance use disorder and trauma is not a moral failing and does affect millions of us in the Commonwealth and across the United States from accessing the vital health care we need, where we are, and when we need it. The time to stand up together is now, and in my world we have a saying, together we can. And my Latinx brothers and sisters, si se puedes. Yes, we can. And this is why I'm going to Washington, D.C. on June 20, 2020. So I hope that you will join me and thousands of us from Massachusetts as we march in D.C. on June 20, 2020 for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral Wa March on Washington.
Be the family. My name is James Shera. Um, I'm a, 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 bear with me now, I'm the co-founder of a street paper called Spare Change News and a proud member of the National Union of the Homeless and the Poor People's Campaign. And I'm glad to be here now. <laughs> Homelessness shouldn't exist. Let me repeat that. Homelessness shouldn't exist in the so in the so-called richest and most powerful nation on earth. And yet, it allows veterans who fight its wars to come back with traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, and other mental and physical issues to sleep on sidewalks, in subway stations, and in alleyways. Why does, why does this country cater to the rich while allowing working class men and women who work multiple jobs with long hours live in places that are unfit for humanity? Why do they allow children to sleep in cars with their parents, in graveyards, under bridges, and at times have to sacrifice their dignity to survive? Nelson Mandela said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way it treats its children, then maybe this country has lost its soul. Why are those dealing with substance abuse on the streets are treated, in less than, are treated as less than human? They are looked at as lepers. Fingers are pointed and judgments made instead of, and judgments made. Instead of helping the homeless, they are criminalized, abused, and arrested, and preyed upon by bullies and marginalized. And when we die in the street, there is no funeral, no one to mourn. We, put, we are put in wooden boxes, buried and forgotten. My hero, Dr. King, once said, an edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring. Yes, it does. We need to change the narrative. We need to organize, empower, and educate ourselves. Nearly 30 years ago, we the homeless created a newspaper. We lifted up our own voices, told our own stories. We realized that no one is coming to save us. We need to save ourselves. We did that. We got tired of the judgment. We got tired of being portrayed as liars, drunks, and thieves. We got tired of losing our children <clears throat> to a state, to the state that who did nothing to help us keep them. We got tired of the ruling class who designed a shelter industrial complex that in turn has done everything in its power to keep us down and divided. We proved by our own example that homeless people with the proper resources can change things for ourselves. I'm asked all the time, James, when are you going to stop preaching about the homeless and just go away. First of all, it's we, it's not I. And we'll go away when people no longer sleep in doorways. We'll go away when people no longer sleep in cars and under bridges. We'll go away when people who abuse substances are treated as human beings and given treatment on demand. It's a health care issue, damn it. We'll go away when you tear down the shelter industrial complex and build safe, affordable housing with decent jobs. We'll go away when attacking homeless people is made a hate crime. We'll go away when youth are allowed to live as youth and not forced it by the streets to find a way to survive. Until then, we will be right here. There are more of us than there are of you. We are the Poor People's Campaign, we are the National Union of Homeless, and we will rise.
right. Has a right. To live. To live. Health care. Health care. Everybody. Everybody. Don't stop. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, has come up with a series of demands. And I want you to say those demands after I say them. I know that you are here for the same reason we all are here, to put our elected official on notice. We demand an immediate restoration of the Voting Rights Act. We demand an end to racist gerrymandering. We demand a reversal of state laws that prevent municipalities from raising minimum wage. We demand a just immigration system. We demand a timely citizenship process that guarantees everyone the right to vote. We demand an end to military aggression and warmongering. We demand a stop to privatization of military budget and any increase in military spending. We demand a ban on assault rifles and a ban on the easy access of firearms. We demand an end to federal programs that send military equipment into local and state communities. We demand that the call to build a wall at the U.S.-Mexico border be ceased. We demand a ban on fracking, mountaintop removal, coal mining, coal ash ponds, and offshore drilling. We demand a ban on all new pipelines, refineries, and coal, oil, and gas export terminals. We demand an immediate implementation of federal and state living wage laws. We demand, we demand the right for all workers. The right for all to form, to form and join unions. We demand, we demand equal, pay equal pay for equal work. For equal work. We, demand we demand a guaranteed annual income. Guaranteed annual income. We, demand we demand fully funded, funded anti-poverty programs anti program. that protects the welfare of us all. We demand Decent, 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 decent housing. We demand free tuition. We demand free tuition. We demand equity in education. We demand an end to the resegregation of schools. We demand equitable funding for historically black colleges and universities. We demand relief from crushing household student and consumer debt. We demand the repeal of the 2017 federal tax law And we demand that the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share. We believe that we can win. We believe that we can win. We believe that we can win. We believe that everybody Everybody, Everybody has, a right, has, a right, has a right, has a right, to live, to live, to live. To live, to live. I want you to know that when hands that once picked cotton, join hands of Latino, join hands of progressive whites, join faith hands and labor hands and Asian hands and Native American hands and poor hands and wealthy hands with a conscience and gay hands and straight hands and trans hands and Christian hands and Jewish hands and Muslim hands and Hindu hands and Buddhist hands. When we all get together, we are an instrument of redemption. When we join hands, we can revive and make
make sure that the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection under the law is never taken away from anybody. So I got a question. Are the rejected ready to revive and declare that this land is your land? This land is my land. This land is our land. And together, from the state house to the white house, the rejected are going to demand that this nation never give up on being one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. people banding together, demanding that this country change for the better. To call for a radical redistribution of political and economic power. Yeah, let's, let's hear for that. That's what we're demanding, right? A radical redistribution of political and economic power. We're calling for a revolution of moral values. And we're saying we must do more. More mobilizing. More organizing. More registering. More educating people for a movement that votes. We're signing people up to be part, to be a leading force in a transformative movement that is building power. So we've already heard why we need to fight, why we need to organize, why we have to mobilize and register and educate and agitate. We've heard from those who have little or even nothing to lose. We've heard from those who have the power, the rejected, to lead this revival. And I want to put a couple of the stories we heard already this evening into the larger light of Massachusetts. Did you know that here in Massachusetts, 43% of the population is poor or one emergency away from deep poverty? That's almost 3 million people. 50% of all kids in this state, 707,000 of them. One point one million people of color, 1.8 million poor white people. Did you know that there are almost 400,000 people in Massachusetts who are uninsured? That 11% of census tracts in this state are made up of people who can't afford water. When in the words of Dr. King, the world is made of two-thirds water, 
why can't people pay their water bills? There's almost 18,000 people on the records who are homeless. That's the sixth highest total in the country. Did you know that working and living in Massachusetts, it would take 100 hours of work per week if you're making the state minimum wage to afford even just a two-bedroom apartment. And that a third of the workforce in this state makes under $15 an hour. I could keep on going. And I'm sure there's a lot more stories actually in this room of people who are not getting by. So with all of the levels of injustice, with these problems we're facing, we want to talk about our demands, the solutions to the problems that we're facing. When I looked up the definition of the word demand in that online dictionary, it says, to ask for with authority, to claim as a right, an urgent, pressing requirement. That same online dictionary defines power as the ability to act, the capacity to direct the course of events, a right, an authority. We are building power to enact our demands. Frederick Douglass, as he was working to abolish slavery, said this about demands, said this about why people must build power. He said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did. It never will. Ida B. Wells, confronting lynching, said, if this work can arouse the conscience of the American people to a demand for justice for every person and punishment by law for the lawless, I shall feel I have done a service. And the Reverend Dr. King, as he and Cesar Chavez and the National Welfare Rights Organization and coal miners in Kentucky and the Jewish Federation and others who are building the 1968 Poor People's Campaign said, our nettlesome task is to discover how to organize our strength into compelling power so that the government cannot elude our demands. It would be the height of naivete to wait passively until the administration had somehow been infused with such blessings of goodwill that it implored us for our programs. That's a pretty good quote. <laughs> Even the Bible has a lot to say about demands especially what God demands of the nations and what God's people must demand of those with power and authority. Micah 6 says, what does the Lord demand of you but to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? Leviticus demands that we welcome the immigrant stranger. Deuteronomy demands that nations forgive debts, outlaw slavery, pay people what they deserve. Isaiah demands that we stop passing laws that deprive the poor of their rights. Jeremiah has the wealthy stop evicting people, gentrifying their community, making misery for the poor. In Luke, John the Baptist demands that the military and ruling authorities stop exhorting money and spreading lies about others. In John, in John, God demands that religious leaders stop covering for those who divide and lie and instead take the side of the poor. The Gospels tell stories of Jesus turning over tables, engaging in what we call holy disruption, 
committing himself even unto death to demand justice for the poor. These prophetic leaders remind us that movements don't just curse the darkness. We don't just awake the nation with what is wrong, but we come together in power with our demands. We rise together until we can claim all of our rights. We're trying out a new song that we haven't sung this evening in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. It's one that's performed by Hozier, um, inspired by Nina Simone. It's titled, We Cry Power. And I don't know if folks haven't heard it. I encourage you, after you leave this evening, to listen to it on YouTube. The song talks about, it's not the waking, it's the rising. Reverend Barber often points out that you can be awake but still in bed. <laughs> We've been spending the past three years traveling around waking up the nation to the problems that are about us. And now, as we move towards June 20th, we are rising together in power. I'll share a couple of the words, but I do encourage you to read it. He says, it's not the waking, it's the rising. It is the ground of a foot uncompromising. It's not forgoing of the lie, it's not opening of the eyes. It's not the waking, it's the rising. It's not the song, it is the singing. It is the heaven of the human spirit ringing. It is the bringing of the line. It is the burying of the lie. It's not the waking, it's the rising. It's not the war, but what's behind it. Lord, the fear of foul men is mere assignment. And everything that we're denied by keeping the divide, it's not the waking, it's the rising. And then it continues and says that Nina cried power. That Billy cried power. That Martin cried power. And we in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for more revival, are crying power. 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 So as we've traveled around the nation, weaving together this moral fusion movement, we hear those cries of power. We hear them from moms in Detroit and in Maine whose children have been taken away from them just because they can't afford their water bills, just because they're too poor to be able to afford a house, but who have said, who have demanded, who have cried power and said, take away our poverty, not our children. We've heard people crying power in St. James Parish in Louisiana, where yet another petrochemical company is coming into Cancer Alley, polluting the school at 700 times the legal limit. And this company's trying to come in, and, and the people of St. James cried power and sing out, victory is mine. Victory is mine. We told Formosa to get thee behind. And victory today is mine. They cried power. Leaders from the homeless union who assert that we are homeless but not helpless, who demand an end to steamrolling of homeless encampments, an end to criminalizing the poor, when it really should be a crime to have poverty in this, the most richest nation in the world. The homeless union cries power. Or preachers in Alabama who remind us that poor people are not sinners, but poverty is a sin that God demands be ended. The Poor People's Campaign is crying power. And we're crying out with this powerful set of demands. We have a budget. 
where we demonstrate that if the nation cuts the military budget, making the country a whole lot safer, taxes those who can afford it the most, and invest in programs like healthcare and education and living wage jobs and voting rights, we can actually indeed end systemic racism and poverty and ecological devastation and militarism. And we can confront this distorted moral narrative that poor people are to blame for every problem, a, a narrative that tries to pit us against each other, and a narrative that feeds us this lie of scarcity when, when the truth is that we're living in a beautiful world of abundance. We've been doing some of the numbers and found out that actually that poverty, inequality costs us more than ending them do. The child poverty costs more than one trillion dollars this year. One trillion dollars just because we won't spend that less than 2% of the budget to end child poverty. It doesn't have to be this way. That unstable housing actually costs the United States $111 billion in unavoidable health care, education costs, that hunger costs this country, $160 billion per year. That public assistance programs, because corporations like Walmart don't pay their workers a living wage, where we subsidize corporations, but then try to cut the poor from social services, actually cost this country $153 billion. And that 250,000 people die every year because of poverty. And it doesn't have to be that way. Because what we found that if we raise the federal minimum wage to $15 per hour right now, not in 10 years, not in 15 years, not in 20 years, right, right now, that would put more than $300 billion into the hands of families and households who then put that back into the economy. $300 billion could be in our communities tomorrow if we just raised that, living, that minimum wage. And that actually, $1 billion invested in SNAP benefits creates $1.7 billion in economic growth. That it actually costs us less and benefits us more to feed hungry families than to invest the 53 cents of every discretionary dollar in the military. <laughs> Poverty costs us more than it costs to address these issues. So we have to organize. So right after Frederick Douglass says that power concedes nothing without a man, he says, it is not the light that we need, but fire. It is not a gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, and the earthquake. Well, Massachusetts, what if we are that fire? What if we are that storm, that whirlwind? What if we in this room, this evening and in the overflow room, right, right next door, are ready to ignite the fire of justice, a storm of truth, a whirlwind of righteousness? Because in times such as these, people are called to come together and build a movement of the people, by the people, and for the people. And we have to keep a little perspective in times such as these. We must remember that these are not the most difficult of times. Things have actually been worse than they are now. We've had other racist leaders in this country. We've had other rulers throughout history who have claimed that they're good for the economy that they will make that nation first, that they actually are the saviors of the poor. 
at the same time as impoverishing the majority, cutting taxes for the wealthy, and building towers with their name on them. <laughs> so in times as these, we have to go back to movement leaders who have faced similar oppressive moments. Frederick Douglass, in that same speech, says the whole history of progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. If we ever get free from the oppressions and wrongs heaped upon us, we must pay for their removal. We must do this by labor, by suffering, by sacrifice, and if need be, by our lives and the lives of others. I share this quote because we've learned from those in South Africa that a dying mule kicks the hardest. So what if what's happening right now in our country and in our world are the dying pains of a broken, hurtful system? And what if in these times we're called to be midwives for a more just system that when we lift from the bottom, everybody rises? I think we need to remind ourselves of the courage and the perseverance and the power that it takes to nonviolently and fundamentally change the system that we're living in. Over the past two and a half years, the Poor People's Campaign has built coordinating committees in more than 40 states across the country. We've met tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people chronicled those demands. We've spent time all across the country we organized the largest and most expansive wave of nonviolent civil disobedience in U.S. history at 40 state capitals and in Washington, D.C. We convened in Washington, D.C. for a Poor People's Moral Action Congress and held the largest presidential forum in this election season and presented our budget to the House Budget Committee. And now we're getting ready for a mass poor people's assembly, a moral march on Washington, a generationally transformative event right between the primaries, and they're off to a kind of weird start, <laughs> and the conventions where the agendas get set. In the process, we're demanding a full nationally televised debate, both in the primaries and in the general election. We're coming forward with our budget and saying that this is a roadmap that gets us out of this mess. And we will be in the numbers in Washington, D.C. the day before the summer solstice. We'll be birthing light in this moment of darkness. And who will speak from that stage on June 20th will be the kind of testifiers that shared their truths, shared their solutions this evening. Not a bunch of politicians, not a bunch of people speaking for others, but having to arrest the attention of this nation and hear the truth and hear the fact that we can do better. Dr. King, when he was launching and calling for this last campaign of his life, said there is nothing wrong with a traffic light which says you have to stop for a red light. But when a fire is raging, the fire truck goes right through that red light. Normal traffic had better get out of its way. When a man is bleeding to death, the ambulance goes through those red lights at top speed. Well, there is a fire raging now for the poor of this society. They are living in tragic conditions because of the terrible economic injustices that keep them locked in. Disinherited people all over the world are bleeding to death from deep social, 
and economic wounds. They need brigades of ambulance drivers who will have to ignore the red lights of the present system until the emergency is solved. Well, Massachusetts, are you willing to sign up to be an ambulance driver? Will you organize brigades of ambulances in the form of buses to come to June 20, 2020? Are you willing to ignore the red lights of systematic racism, of poverty, of homophobia, of sexism, of militarism, of ecological devastation, of the lack of health care, of the lack of welfare programs that raise up the poor? Are you willing to ignore all of those broken systems and bust through those red lights until the emergency is solved? We have a tradition in the Poor People's Campaign as we're traveling around and doing this tour of inviting the oldest people in the room and the youngest people in the room to come forward. And that does include the other room. We see it as one big room. So is there anyone that's over 80? Well, come on up. Come on up. Please come join us up here. Come on up from the other room. Come join us. Anybody over 80? And who are the youngest people in the room? Do you have anyone 12 or younger? All right, we got some in the other room. All right, yeah, that's right, hear it for them. Yeah, let's, let's give it up for some of these young people. That's right. We have beautiful elders and beautiful young people up here with us. So first I wanna talk to the, the, the older people in the room. And I first wanna ask, and the movement asks this, your forgiveness. Will you accept our apology? You started many struggles. You gave your life for justice causes. And we need to ask you if you'll do it again. Will you suit up again or stay suited if you've been fighting your whole life? But first, will you forgive us for letting the dream be deferred? For not, for being turned around when we said nobody's going to turn us around. And so I, I, I ask that in, in seriousness. Do you, do you forgive us? Do you forgive us? <laughs> exactly. And then will you, will you suit up again or will you stay suited as you have been to be in this fight? in this moment, in this place, as we dedicate our lives to the work of justice. And then I wanna to talk to the young people. I wanna ask y'all, can we have your permission 
to mess in your future, to mess in your present, to take up the fight alongside of you, arm in arm. Do we have your permission? Can we fight alongside of you? The young people have spoken. Do other young people have, have words to share with us? Can we fight alongside of you? Can we struggle for justice with you? Can you help us lead the way? All right. We're on record now. Both for forgiveness, for not keeping the fight alive, and for permission to make the fight go forward. We don't know whether this moment will be able to win all of our demands, or for laying the basis for the next generation to come. But what we do know is that nobody has won a fight that they haven't fought. And that it is our moral obligation if folks here in Massachusetts, in Greenfield, and related counties are dying, are hurting, are being destroyed by racism and poverty, by ecological devastation and by this war economy, if we don't suit up, do this fight. So I want to call our local leaders, our state leaders, who have a call to action for us. I want us to hear our marching orders. And we close out every one of these gatherings with a song that's about breaking every chain of injustice. And so I ask our, our, our co-chairs here in Massachusetts to offer your call to action and for us to hear what we're called to do. Friends, coming to this meeting is amazing. To hear the messages that we have power is inspiring. And to continue to meet with one another to identify our local issues and the issues at the national level to be able to move our power in this area and beyond is our call. To that end, we will meet every second and fourth Friday at All Souls Church in the Sanctuary. Because we meet at 6 p.m., Stone Soup Cafe will make you a very light, nutritious, delicious meal. Every single one of you is welcome. Our next meeting, we will be sharing our stories because everybody has a story about the way in which the, the system has affected you, us, all of us. And so I invite you to come and be a part of this movement. I invite you to get your ire up. I invite you to get your fight on. I invite you to identify what needs to be identified. I invite you to get ready for June 20, 2020. I invite you to be ready. And I invite you to be with me. Thank you, Sister Kristen. So on the eastern side of Massachusetts, and we all meet somewhere in the middle, because we are mobilizing and organizing towards 620 2020. So on every 20th of the month, we will be meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. And now it could be in the surrounding communities check out our new website, which will have all the locations, times, and we already know the date, when every 20th of the month leading into June. 
In between that time, we will be hosting and coordinating along with our Boston Teachers Union folks who's here, raise your hand, our Boston <laughs> Teachers Union moms who's one of our coordinators. We are hosting along with our arts and cultural person in the back, Domingo, raise your hand. It'll be on our calendar, music, arts, and cultural series, along with rocking the vote towards all roads lead to where? Washington, D.C. So be on the lookout, we're on our webpage for every 20th of the month, June 20th, 2020, in Washington, D.C., we will all be there mobilizing what? Thousands of people from Massachusetts. So I ask you if you're able to stand for this last song, but make sure this is a first meeting, a second meeting, a tenth meeting, but make sure you've filled out this form. Do not leave until you have. And if you need a copy, Folk have more. Just raise your hand, they'll bring them by. Because we're not organizing in this, this, this moment. We're building a movement. And movements are made of people holding hands with others, marching in the numbers as we build power and call for justice. So we're gonna sing this song together. If you don't know it, you can learn it. There's not many words to it. It's become a theme song for this campaign. Dr. King in the last years of his life said, the poor and dispossessed of this nation live in a cruelly unjust society. If they can be helped to take action together, they will do so with a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. So beginning in the new year, we will be recruiting thousands to build this nonviolent army, this freedom church of the poor, and come in the numbers to Washington. Well, we hear that call today in 2020. We're called to break every chain, every chain of racism and poverty, every chain of people not being able to afford water even though the world is made of two-thirds water. And so we sing this with hope and inspiration that the next times that we're together, we will have won. We will have achieved our demands and we will be building a powerful movement that can break every chain of injustice.
on piano. Philippe Simon on drums. Thank you, everybody. Be safe, and we'll see you in Washington, D.C. Jeff on the saxophone. Thank <laughs> you.